So I want to welcome everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Jacqueline McGinnis. I am a career management specialist in the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers. I work with my colleague, Carlos Flores. Carlos, if you want to introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. I'm Carlos Flores. I work in our SMLR Career Services office as well. And we have Andrea with us from the Honors College. Hey, everybody. I'm Andrea Rydell, and I serve as the Assistant Dean of Professional Development and Alumni and Corporate Engagement. And I'm really excited that we got to partner with Similar for this. So thank you to Jacqueline and Carlos. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. And I would like to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Tonight, we are going to be discussing life after college. So tips from similar alumni. Uh, at least one of the alumni on this panel was also part of the Honors College. And it's a great opportunity for you to really hear about how they settled into their first role professionally once they finished their degree at Rutgers. Um, so with no further ado, Molly, would you like to introduce yourself? We'll do Molly, Stephen, and Brandy. Sure. Thanks, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. I am Molly. Of course, I'm from New Jersey, um, but live in New York City now. I went to Rutgers for both my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree. Um, I studied psych, and as soon as I took my industrial organizational psych class, I completely fell in love with it. Um, and I was lucky enough to have an advisor who told me that I was um, you know, a perfect match for the graduate program that was really like an expanded version of that class. So I went right into my um, Master's of Labor Studies and Employment Relations program there at Rutgers. Um, I started working at a company called The Ladders, which is an internet job board um, while I was in school and then moved to Ernst & Young, a big four accounting firm, was there for a bunch of years. Um, and now I am at a media company called Media Planet um, as the head of people. So I run the entire HR recruiting talent, anything related to the employee function. Um, and it is great to be here and I'm excited to share a little bit of some advice with you guys. Thank you, Stephen. Well, hey everyone, I am Stephen. I'm Rutgers class of 2019, double majored in women's and gender studies and human resource management, was also in the honors college. Andrea was one of my deans. Um, I interned twice at Goldman Sachs in the Human Capital Management Division, then joined full-time upon graduating. I um, work out of the New York office. I started on the talent assessment team, so think um, performance management and leadership pipelining. And back in October, I got the opportunity to take internal mobility and transfer to a team of IO psychologists where we do people science and employee listening. And in the fall, I'll be starting my master's in information experience design at the Pratt Institute. So super excited for that. Great, that's awesome. Brandy? Hi, I'm Brandy. I <clears throat> double majored at Rutgers um, in labor and employment relations along with communications and then got my master's in labor and employment relations. Shortly after I worked for the school a little bit while I was looking for a full-time job and landed at PepsiCo as initial um, position and then went to a few other companies like BF Corporation, did a little bit of time in sort of the SaaS startup world, and then really spent quite a few years at WeWork um, as a senior talent partner. And now I'm at Warby Parker as talent acquisition manager. Um, so yeah, super excited to talk to all of you guys here. Thank you. Andrea? Yeah, so I think we'll start with our first question. So how did you determine if an organization was going to be a good fit for you? And you can just unmute and you'll see if anybody else is unmuting so we don't talk over each other. Yeah, so maybe we can go in the same order as before. We can do Molly, okay. um, Steven, and Brandy. Yeah, sure. So I think for understanding if an organization is a good fit for you is, is a great way to phrase the question because typically I think we think interviewing is just about, you know, impressing the interviewer um, and for the company to determine if you're a good fit for them, but it really is a two-way street and it's important for you to think, you know, prior to interviewing, think about experiences you've had if they are jobs, any type, corporate, retail, babysitting, part-time, truly any type of role, um, internships, even certain academic settings, think about 
things that you've loved, where you've thrived, what you've disliked, what characteristics in teachers were helpful for you, right? That'll translate to managers, how you learn best, you know, what, what settings were like optimal for your performance. Um, you know, were you better in lectures for small groups? Like try to think about some of those experiences. That's what you're going to want to evaluate for and ask. Um, you might even have key values that are really important to you. Maybe, you know, you want to work for a company that has a really diverse board of directors, or it's important for you to work at a company that has, um, you know, really clear charitable initiatives. Like do a little bit of prep, I should say a lot of prep um, of what's important to you and also do research on the company. You might get a lot of answers on your own, but anything that you don't get, ask about it live. You're making a big commitment to work for them. So it's important to get the answers that you need. Cool. For me, it was um, a super methodical approach. I just, I think in <laughs> systems. So like my, <laughs> my criteria is the same way. So I literally just made like a table in Excel and I said, like, what are the different criteria I could evaluate an organization on? And I sort of prioritized like what's most important to me. So is that location, compensation, like culture, values, diversity. And then from there, I just literally went down my list, like rank ordered them and checked off, like based on like the companies I was looking at, like, do they fit, which is my top one. So maybe not everyone will want something like so mechanical, but it worked really well for me and maybe it will work for you too. Yeah, I had a pretty different approach. Um, I think when I first started looking in the job market, my list was just to get a job because I really wanted experience. Um, so initially it was just to get in and get in at a company that I know could, their name alone could really carry a lot of weight because you learn so much there. Um, now that I'm a little bit further in my career, I really have a short list of things that are absolutely important to me that I'm not willing to negotiate on or give up on. So those, I have my short list and depending on if the company meets all of them, that's when I decide if I'm going to apply or continue a conversation and get through the interview. Sometimes you don't, you, or you can't tell just by applying. So sometimes it's worth just having the conversation and getting your questions answered initially. That way you can decide whether or not, like Molly said, if this is the right company for you, you should be interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. That's wonderful advice. Yes, I think um, one of the things that was running through each of your responses was that you have a few things in mind that are like your core values that the company needs to meet or else you're not even going to apply. And that's very important to have that criteria determined before you start a really big search process um, because it's easy to get caught up in things, right? Because um, People are really good at pitching a company when yeah. they're recruiting, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so the second question is, um, what was the most difficult transition for you once you started your, your first professional role? Um, and we can get into the, the subtext, um, which is around um, often students are concerned that they will get into their role, but maybe not like it. And then they're going to be stuck for a year because you know you have to at least last a year in the first role to not look like you're jumping around, if at all possible. Um, so if there's anything that you're thinking of sharing, um, maybe there's a little piece around that um, of what they would do if, if that's like a situation that they're in where they're a little nervous to commit um, because what if they don't like it? Yeah, so I'll kind of start with that second part because I think it's a good segue from the first question. Like, even though you are making this huge commitment in this job that you're, you know, signing up for, I don't always subscribe to that. Like, you have to be there for a certain amount of time. I've looked at thousands of resumes, as I know Brandy has too. And like, if someone says they left a job after a few months because you know, the reality was different than the perception they got in the interview, or they have, you know, an explanation that that feels relatable and honest. Like I can understand that. I wouldn't make a habit out of it. I think seeing it once or twice on a resume is okay. Um, more than that's definitely a flag, but know that you aren't going to know what a job is like until you're there for six months to a year. I feel like that's kind of where that rule came from because you do want to give it a chance the first three months is a blur. You're just like learning what you're even doing and who everyone is. 
Um, but just, just know that it's also okay to find yourself in a situation where you do feel like you have to exit. Um, if you are hung up on staying, I would say my advice is like, you know, obviously exercise all your options to try to make it work in your role with your manager. But if not, maybe there's another team you can transfer to or a different role that's available at the company. So it doesn't feel like you're going to have this, you know, blind spot on your resume. Um, so try to explore some of those if, if you are hung up on, on not exiting the company. But going back to the most difficult transition, Honestly, for me, it was like the independence and autonomy that came from working my my first real job um, while I was in school, but it was a full time role was at a startup. And so my manager was so hands off, um, very uninvolved, like we had very infrequent check ins. It was just kind of like, here's your task. See you later. Hope it goes well, um, which was a great learning experience looking back. But it was so different than being in school where you know, you have an exam on X date and you either show up and show out um, or, you know, there are repercussions. Um, you know, you have a paper due or an assignment due and there's preset deadlines and, and things that happen if you don't meet those. Um, whereas work was, you know, much more broader initiative, strategic thinking um, and a lot more independence. So I sort of had to get really regimented really quick. Um, and start being my own manager in a way um, that was very different from academic life. For me, I'll start with the transition part. I'd say it was shifting from a sprint mindset to a marathon mindset. So when you're kind of an undergrad and you're doing internships or even just like the idea of semesters, you have anywhere from 10 to 14 weeks and everything's contained within that time period. And it's sort of like, there's a clear end point, but it was about like the, I'd say like 15, 16 week mark when I started full-time, I was like, oh, this is, this is not disappearing. Like the, the project you really like is going to still be there and be your project, but also that task that you don't like doing is not going anywhere. And like, if you were an intern and you're like, oh, I just got like three more weeks. Um, so that was just really hard to reconcile with as like, really, unless you leave the organization, retire, or, uh, well, you don't want to think about dying, but like, the, <laughs> um, those are the only ways that like, it's like ending. So you've just got to think more so like long-term about like, what do I want? What do I want to work on? And it's much different than I think just having your syllabus or like your internship projects. And then in terms of, um, the concern about like feeling stuck in a role, I'd say that, um, and Molly touched on this, the idea of internal mobility and looking within the organization to see like, are there other options and roles I can move to? I found that about after a year, I didn't really wanna do performance management as much, but I loved like IO psychology and learning about like what people scientists do and sending surveys. I was able to make that internal move before I really like burned out in my old role, which was awesome that the firm could retain me in that way. I love that analogy too, Stephen. Um, for me, I guess I'll start off with the transition. A huge thing for me is I feel like a lot of students in college, or maybe it was just me, can read a book and retain the information and move on and take the exam, right? But in work, it takes so much more. You have to put in so much more work and you have to be dedicated to it because if you're just skating by, you're never going to be happy with the work you're doing and you're always going to be looking for the next thing. So I think my biggest concern was that I was getting in my own way, feeling that I wasn't being challenged enough, but I wasn't giving myself the opportunity to actually sit down, understand the work in full scope because I felt like it was easy and I was breezing through it. But it's okay to raise your hand and say, hey, maybe I feel like this is too easy for me. Is there a way I can take on more work? Is there a way I can do something challenging? Because you won't be able to move forward or move up in that specific organization without showing that you can really complete the task and be very successful in it in order to take on more things. So I say one thing you should be wary of is getting in your own head and getting in your own way and starting to tell yourself you don't like the job before you even given the job a chance. Um, I've jumped around from, from time to time because I did feel like I'm in a contract role I'm older, I need to get benefits or, hey, this just really wasn't the right culture for me. And I felt like it was a shock and it was a little toxic, but you know, you know, once you start to interview and understand the organization, you start to understand exactly what you're looking for and what your needs are. 
That's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Carlos, do you want to move to the third question? Yep, sounds good. So uh, I think Molly mentioned earlier how the first three months in a job can feel like a whirlwind and you're really just getting the lay of the land, right? And getting to meet everybody that's on your team and in your organization. So this question is geared a little bit towards that. So can you talk about how you started to build that relationship or that rapport with your manager, but also your colleagues uh, during your first year of work? Yeah, it's a little bit harder, um, I think, virtually now um, to do this, especially when you're new. Um, but I'll kind of talk about what it what it was like for me being um, in the office and, you know, some ways to replicate that. I think overall, my best advice is like make the most of the organic opportunities just as much as you are the formal ones. Like don't dismiss the impact of being in an elevator with someone and having, you know, a minute to talk to them or probably even less, um, you know, both being in the hallway, walking towards the bathroom together, you know, or meeting up at the coffee machine and just like having casual conversation. Sometimes those are the little convos or introductions that can lead to a more formal meeting that person will recognize you in the future. It will just start to sort of spiral into a relationship. Um, or even if it's just a familiar face, really, really take advantage of those opportunities because you're only going to keep expanding your network. Even if the people are not on your team, you know, maybe not in your department, maybe not your manager, um, you just never know what that could turn into. So it's really important, I think, to capitalize on those. Um, you know, we tend to maybe be walking down the hallway and be texting or looking at our phone or thinking about something else. And you might be standing next to someone who could really have a tremendous impact on your career. Um, so just take advantage of those. And then of course, like also be setting up formal meetings. Hey, do you mind if we have coffee? If it's just 10 minutes, I want to introduce myself, get to know you. Like everybody loves to talk about themselves. So it's going to be very rare that you find somebody that turns you down to tell you about their role or their experience at a company. And just don't be afraid to be that bold, friendly, forward person um, and invite people to do things. It, it can be a free outing. You know, you don't have to be going around offering to buy everyone coffee or lunch, um, but really try to be as forward. And like I said, capitalize on every everything, every conversation, every interaction you can, because it will matter down the road. Um, if there are opportunities for mentor, mentee programs that, that your company offers, if your manager runs some type of office hours or, you know, has something that's open to you aside from your one-on-ones or your team meetings, just really try to get all of the opportunities you can to talk to these people, um, as well as, you know, not necessarily your manager and, and every single person on your team, but people outside of your department too. Just do as much as you can, do the most here, more is more. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo what Molly said about like being that person who's like overly friendly and reaching out. I identify as like a strongly introverted person, but even still I like, I really force myself and I'm like, just, just send the calendar invite and like go for the coffee chat or the catch up. Cause I found that it's just a lot more pleasant and comfortable to work for someone where you like just know a little bit about them and like what they do on the weekends like their family their kids names like stuff like that makes it a lot easier especially when like problems and conflicts come up it's much easier to resolve that with someone that you know them as more than just like a blocker to getting your work done but like an actual human that you like are interested in outcomes for them and care about them so yeah just really putting yourself out there the other thing is like especially as like a fairly junior entry level employee, the um, the barrier to like reaching out and showing an interest and wanting to build a network, like everyone acknowledges like, oh, you're new here. Like, of course, this person wants to meet people. So it's not weird for you to like reach out. So it's another reason not to feel insecure doing so. Yeah, I echo what both of them say. Um, also, a key thing is people do not leave the actual organization. They leave managers. When you have a bad manager, you do not want to be there. Um, and when I look back at the times I jumped, it was because I didn't feel like I had the manager that I needed. So it's important for you to not only build that rapport with your manager as soon as you start, but during the interview process, try to understand what type of manager they are. Are they a micromanager? Are they a, allow you to have the autonomy to get your job done? Um, another thing, coffee chats are the easiest way. Everyone 
likes coffee or tea or water. Um, so it's so easy to just ask someone to grab coffee and learn more about them personally rather than the work they're doing. And then that can lead up and build up to the work. And asking for their time is not hard at all. Sometimes it's just, hey, I'd love to get 15 minutes on your calendar. I know you're very busy. I'd love to understand how you got to where you're at. Everyone loves someone who's trying to mimic their career, as Molly said, or loves to talk about themselves and what they did. So um, it's easy to ask for that time. Um, it's just a matter of you actually putting in the effort as well and meeting them there halfway. Great, thanks for sharing your insight. I think I wanna chime in one, one note to that. So for the students that are listening right now who might either be graduating or doing an internship where it's remote, and you don't have those opportunities for those quick water cooler chats and, you know, seeing people walking down the hallway or um, to Brandy's point, you know, just setting up what's, what we refer to as informational interviews. So having those quick, you know, 10, 15 minute chats with individuals, there are many ways to reach out to alumni, just like these three on LinkedIn, send a quick note. We have student alumni career connect. Uh, you know, Andrea, Carlos, and I are happy to assist any of you just try to set up and build some confidence and just write even like a little blurb that you could send to multiple alumni to, to connect. And then that's the same way that you would be building rapport with, with colleagues. And so, again, if you don't have that opportunity that's in person with the organization, if you are remote, you can still set up those informal chats. And as Brandy said, kind of People love to have someone mirroring them and try to learn more about their career and their goals and the projects that they're currently working on. So just keep in mind that you can still do that remotely as well. It, might, it looks different, but it's, it's great advice. So thank you all. And sorry, one other <laughs> thing I wanted to mention, which I thought about is that if you have that report with your manager, ask your manager to set up or introdu introduce you to some colleagues and coworkers. They're the easiest person. They're already rooting for you to be successful because it reflects on them. So just ask them to intro you to that person as well. Great, that's great. Thank you for mentioning that, Brandy. I'm gonna kick this off to Steven first. Uh, did you have a mentor when you started your first professional role? And if so, was this assigned to you or is this someone that you found uh, on your own? Maybe if Steven and, and Molly, if you can answer this and Brandy will have you start off on the next one. Yeah, so um, in terms of having a mentor, I had both an external mentor. So my first manager when I was an intern at the firm, she left after that summer, but we were able to stay in touch for the next couple of years. So it was great to have someone who had been at Goldman, but also was like outside to just generally like talk about things with and have an outsider's view. And then in terms of internally, when I started, I am um, I was more aggressive than most and my manager was going to assign one, but I asked if I could just interview people that I found interesting instead. And for me, I love like, I don't know, for me, like with mentorship, I really want to talk to the person and know like, do we vibe? Do I feel comfortable? So I asked my manager and some other people in my network for recommendations. I had my short list of like five people and then I put them through the first round, a second round interview. And then afterwards I checked like if they had capacity to take on a mentee and I found someone who was like a really good fit for that year. So that was my approach, but um, lots of different ways to think about it. That's amazing. I love that you interviewed people to be your mentor. I need to start doing that. Um, I had a formal mentor assigned to me when I started. It was it was called a peer advisor. So it was somebody who um, was kind of close in age to me at a similar like level um, in the company. And she took me to coffee and lunch when I started. She was there to answer some of those questions that you're sometimes too embarrassed to ask your manager about, like, you know, where's the bathroom? Where are the good snacks? You know, what do I wear? Things like that. Um, which was such an important person to have um, when you're starting and you're just kind of like, you know, you're nervous and you're trying to impress people and, and uh, it's great to have that type of ally. Um, and then I also probably after about three months or so, once they like knew the lay of the land a little bit, I sought out somebody that um, I just really like, she was in a, in a role that I admired. Um, she seemed like somebody who I could learn a lot from. And so, um, I contacted her and, and asked her if she had 30 minutes for me just to ask her some questions and get a little bit of insight. Um, and that was like almost nine years ago and we still keep in touch. Um, so it was somebody that 
Um, you know, she didn't necessarily help me get acclimated right away, but she's just became a professional mentor to me. Um, I'll also say now in, in my current role with people starting remotely, we've hired like 15 or so people in the last uh, couple quarters. Um, and I make it a point to set them up with somebody in advance of their first day, like before they even get to day one, somebody we're working remote. So somebody calls them on zoom, they have, you know, an opportunity to connect and exchange contact info and keep in touch. And we've gotten really good feedback that it makes such a difference in terms of someone feeling comfortable and like they can exhale before day one. Um, and to just have that relationship already starting before they even get in the door. So I, I really recommend getting a mentor. Hopefully you're assigned one, but if not, be forward and, and ask for one. Thank you for those insights. I do want to take a moment to plug that SMLR does have a formal mentorship program where we connect alumni directly with our current students. So for any students on the call today who are majoring or minoring in HR or labor studies, if you wanna be paired up with a mentor, I'm gonna put in a link in the chat for you to apply for our mentorship program and our panelists, no pressure, but if you would like to be a mentor to a student, feel free to reach out, happy to get you started on that process as well. Um, so our next question is, uh, do you have to move, did you have to move to a new location for your first role? Did you relocate? And if you did, how was that experience adapting to a new environment? Maybe uh, Brandy, if you can kick this off, and then Molly, if you want to answer as well, and Stephen, we'll have you start the next one. Yeah, um, mine is sort of boring. I've never relocated for a new job. I've always worked within the city or um, Jersey City downtown area, so there's that. Yeah, I never had to like totally move. Um, I did commute from obviously when I was living in central New Jersey and going to school in New Brunswick. Um, I was working full time in the city. So I was taking that crazy long train ride um, both ways and then going to school at night. I did end up moving into New York City simply, you know, I, I wanted to be here for social reasons and and uh, to be closer to work and to not have to commute. Um, but a lot of companies now, I've, I've worked at some that um, really offer a ton of relocation benefits. So if you are in a position where, um, you know, you are relocating for a job, like it's okay to definitely ask if the company does anything for you. We, I've been in situations where we've offered obviously financial benefits for people to help people relocate. Um, and also some, you know, networking ones as well to help introduce them to people when they're moving. So don't discount that a company can't help you with that too. Great, that's really helpful. That's good advice to ask if you, you know, it's um, someone put a question in the chat about negotiation, but that is part of that process too, because you're looking at a total compensation package. Uh, totally, if more. they want you, they'll get you there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Stephen, for you to, to kick it off and then Brandy, maybe you can follow up after. Uh, what resource did you, did you utilize to help you progress as a professional? So essentially, you know, I'm asking in regards to blogs, podcasts, websites, we already talked about mentoring. Was there something specific that you were reviewing within an industry? What did you use and what are you still using to kind of help you progress outside of your organization as far as your, your interests? Yeah, so for me, I'll generally um, start by like interviewing or just asking someone who has like the expertise I'm looking to build, like if someone's really good at networking or if they have like a hard skills, like when I wanted to learn more about people analytics, I just found people who knew about that and then used them to direct me towards like blogs and podcasts. I could theoretically like search for those things myself, but I found that like I get a lot higher quality resources by just like reaching out to an expert, an expert and seeing like what's the number one book or like podcast you'd recommend. So can you think of like one particular resource that you could recommend for students that you use in the past that would be helpful for them to look at? I'm kind of sticking yeah. you on the spot if you can think of something. Oh, no worries. Um, I personally really like the podcast design MBA. It just um, helps me think about like professional life and the business field in a different way and challenges me to think not just like in such like a traditional corporate mindset, but about like startups and how like we can all take ownership of our career and be mini CEOs. Nice. Brandy, what about you? 
Yeah, I have to agree with Steve and I love going to the person directly as I was looking to build additional skills. I'd go to my mentor or the person who's done the job directly. But I would say for me, I really like the muse and built in. It gives you insight on jobs that are open, but also gives you insight into like hot industries. Um, and I also like how I built this podcast because if you're targeting a specific um, company, they tend to do CEOs and startups. So I really like listening because then it gives me an edge up when I'm actually interviewing and I can actually speak to some of the things that they built. And it also gives me my own personal ideas. Great. That was really helpful. I guess, Molly, do you have any that you like as well? I wrote how I built this in the chat, literally as Brandy was saying it. It's it's a great podcast, even if you're not, you know, trying to start your own your own business tomorrow. It's just really cool to hear from these, you know, mega successful people, like little tips and habits. Sometimes they just talk about like what time they wake up in the morning. Like it can be really helpful to sort of give you um, a new perspective on being a professional. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. So our next question is all about networking. So how, how would you suggest people begin to network with individuals who are outside of your organization, maybe other individuals who are in your industry or in your field, but maybe they don't work in the same company as you. Um, and I know Brandy, Brandy and I served on a panel recently for a labor studies class and we talked about the importance of LinkedIn. So maybe Brandy, you can also touch on your tips around LinkedIn as well. Yeah, I love this so much. I mean, LinkedIn is just the easiest way because it's virtually, and you don't have to put much effort in, but a really cool thing that's happening a lot is when you're using different applicant tracking systems or just any systems that are integrated into um, your organization that you're using on a day-to-day, -day, they do a lot of networking events. Like we use one system for diversity and inclusion, um, pipeline building, and they had a networking event today, which was around building cocktails. And it was really just the opportunity to meet people, not do any recruiting, but hey, take, we know you've been stressed this quarter, come meet other individuals that are doing the same exact thing you're doing. Or sometimes Greenhouse will have different events like, hey, we're actually talking to the director of talent from Wayfair, and we're talking to all these different directors talking about hiring plans and how to think about diversity first. So those are my favorite things to do is really start getting really close with your account rep for different systems and start actually attending those events. And then of course, LinkedIn is just an easy go-getter when you find amazing candidates and you stay in touch with them throughout the years, uh, which is how I met Molly. <laughs> Anybody else on that topic? I mean, I would just echo what, what Brandy says. LinkedIn is amazing. There is a group for everything. There's a group for your region. There's a group for your industry. Um, there's groups even just for like young professionals or, you know, whatever sort of demographic you, you place yourself in. There's, there's likely a networking group for it. And whether there are conversations happening virtually or in person at some point, like go to them all again, just like be forward. Um, if you're studying for some type of like certification or exam, there might even be study groups. I remember I took my um, SPHR and I joined a class and there was like a study group at the time. And I was able to network with a lot of other HR professionals that way. Like you might find as you're, you know, going for different milestones um, in your career that other people are, are in the same place and you'll get to meet them made me think of uh meetup.com too yeah. you know, i told a lot of students about that I, I i again i haven't really sent as many students that way recently because of a lot of things being remote. but i'm sure things are remote there too and they're doing chats and zooms and google hangouts so definitely yeah if you if students if you haven't used that before you can actually look by industry or by topics so that's a good website too Steven, if you can kick this off, I think I'll have all three of you answer this. So what advice do you have for students if they have not accepted a job prior to graduation? So many students get very anxious or nervous that they haven't accepted a position yet. Um, but, you know, we try to encourage them that, you know, you're going to work at some point in your life. <laughs> so what advice do you have? Maybe Stephen, Brandy, and Molly, can, you can all share. Sure. So the first thing I'd say is like, just don't beat yourself up. Like, period, end of sentence, like the negative self-talk and feeling badly, like it just doesn't, it's not going to like get you closer to having a job. So not putting all of your value and worth in that is like super important and really challenging, but just keeping that top of mind. 
And the other thing I'd say, and being class of 2019 and seeing a lot of my friends in class of 20, 2020 as well, is just like, you can graduate with a job and have things change very quickly. Like I have friends who like their offers were pulled or they joined an amazing rotational program. They were going to get to be international and get a per diem and all of that was taken away. So I'd say just even like securing that initial job isn't like a guarantee that everything will be like perfect and peachy and rosy like from graduation. So really just understanding that like everyone has a different timeline. And even if something is working out initially, like your situation might change. And I even have a friend that graduated with me and like just last week, like they landed a really amazing offer in a field that they never anticipated. So it's like things will just come with time and to the extent that you can like be kind to yourself and continue to like upscale and keep learning and reading where you have the energy is what I'd suggest. Stephen, I love everything you said. I agree. You cannot beat yourself up about it. I actually graduated without a job. Um, one thing I will say that actually helped me and sort of bridge the gap is I had a mentor in the School of Labor and Employment Relations who actually gave me a job as a student service coordinator. And she reminded me like, hey, this isn't supposed to be your full time job. This isn't what you want to do. Use this as a stepping stone, build out as many skills as possible so you can take that with you to your next opportunity. Um, and don't be afraid to say like, hey, this isn't where I want to end up long term, but it's a good stepping stone. So let me work here for a year and then move on to something better. People understand, especially when you're in a coordinator role or a more junior role, that this is your stepping stone. This is for you to get your feet wet and then you're off into your career. So um, use all those opportunities and really try to build that out in your resume. Yeah, I echo everything that Brandy and Steven said. I think obviously if for financial reasons you need to work somewhere, then, you know, make sure that you're meeting your needs if you have to work part time or in a different, you know, industry or things like that. And, and while you are searching, just like Steven said, upskill as much as you can, network as much as you possibly can. You never know who it's going to be that can help you get there. And honestly, this is advice for always. You might find yourself in 10 years looking for a new job and feeling defeated because you haven't found one in a month or two months or three months of looking. And the advice there is still the same, right? Keep networking, keep going. Don't feel defeated about yourself. It takes time. It's often said it's a full-time job looking for a job and just accept that and try to be patient with yourself. You're dealing with the market, you're dealing with hiring managers, the economy. Um, and it's just, you will know when you find the right match, it's like magic. You're meant to be in this role, but keep reminding yourself that it's, it's worth the wait. Great. Before we move on, I actually think the question in the chat relates. So um, Ning Ming had a question. She just says, hi, Brandy. I love the idea of building skills. What are some skills that you recommend for HR um, or what kind of skills have you built? So I don't know, Brandy, if you want to speak to that and if, if either of the other two, if you have a comment. I actually would love to speak to that, but I think Molly has more of the like full picture of HR since she's um, heading up people. So she knows talent, total rewards, um, so as well as you. HRB work. So she probably <laughs> would be the best in terms of building skills. Oh my gosh, I'm blushing. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it does sort of matter which area of HR I think you want to go into because there are some people who want to go into the sort of, you know, behind the scenes of HR. I want to do payroll and benefits or sometimes analytics. And, and that area kind of requires different skills. My favorite part of HR and um, probably the bulk of my job is the employee relations and coaching and talent development. And just like I am always one on one with our staff all the time. So I think you definitely want to have super high emotional intelligence and be able to understand what people are going through, why they're feeling that way, um, and, you know, how to respond, obviously, appropriately. Um, of course, if you want to be on the other side, details are absolutely everything. HR is very, very risk averse. Um, so you want to make sure that you know, everything is in order and compliant and as it's supposed to be, and you're following every single rule you can possibly imagine, city, state, federal, ones you've never even heard of. Um, so I think, it, I don't know which, if there's a certain area of HR that you, you wanna go into, but obviously there's kind of different areas. Recruiting, I mean, you have to be so social and you know personable and persuasive sometimes, kind of salesy, um, but there really are, are different areas. And I think there's something for everyone, so. 
Yep. I would echo that. And I would probably say communication skills because you're talking to two totally different people. When you're an HRBP, you're talking to your internal stakeholders and those are really your client groups versus being in, on the talent acquisition side. I'm talking to all external people. So I'm showing you what the brand is and how we want to be perceived. So communication skills are absolutely important. And I think once you start growing in your career, you have to have the analytical skills no matter what. Yeah. When you start to realize that you're using the analytics way more than you expected, whether you're a people analyst or whether you are a, um, or whether you are more of a, gen uh, a generalist. Great, thanks. Okay, so with that, uh, I know we had one other question about salary negotiation, which I also think, I think that was up a little bit higher. Yeah, so what are your experiences with negotiation? Uh, I think we should address this just because we've had a couple of questions about this recently. It's, it's a hot topic with students. Um, and since we're talking about the transition to the workforce and your first position, I guess the question I'll, I'll pose to you all is, one, did you ever negotiate a, a salary, like a like maybe not even just a salary number, but a total compensation, like finding out if the position had flexibility with hours or working remote? Um, and secondly, did you have apprehension and how did you overcome that? So I don't know if any of you have negotiated your position in the past. Um, was it your first role? And if not, when when did you do that? Was it your second role, like more senior in your career? I negotiate everything all the time. Um, there's never a reason to not negotiate. Um, even when I went to my absolute first role, I negotiated, I was making a little bit more somewhere else and I was going to take a pay cut. I mean, ultimately the experience was very important to me. So that's what I decided to go with. Um, and you have to weigh the pros and the cons, but I do believe that you need to negotiate everything, um, especially as women and people of color. We tend to get underpaid. Um, women get, I believe, 77 cents to the dollar of a man. Um, and then people of color tend to get around 68 cents. So it's important that you negotiate every single thing. Um, even if, this sounds ridiculous, but even if you feel like you're in a great spot, I always say, try to weigh out the pros and the cons. Like I know people who've gotten exactly what they wanted in compensation, but didn't realize how much they were gonna be traveling. So now your compensation needs to be a reevaluated. Are you paying for your own travel? Or are, you, are they taking care of it for you? And how much time are you gonna be away from home? All those things you need to think about and how it's gonna affect your work-life balance. So yes, negotiate. I completely agree. I negotiated everything. Um, in my very first job, I was in school at the time and commuting to the city and I negotiated my hours because I had to leave by a certain time to make a certain train. I think it was like a half hour and I was sweating like crazy before I asked. And I, it was literally about leaving 30 minutes early. It was so crazy looking back. Um, but just always know like the worst a company will say is no, you can still decide to take the offer or the position or the salary, whatever it is. But if you do not ask, I promise they will not present it to you. Um, I'm on the other side of it now where, you know, people want to negotiate with me and Sometimes it's a yes and sometimes it's a no, but I'd always rather them ask for it. I think do your research and come prepared for sure. Um, you know, sometimes there's market intelligence about, you know, what the average pay is for this role in this area with this much experience. That's really helpful, but also come prepared with sort of like your reasons why, right? Perhaps you've you you know have this experience or you have this qualification that makes you more desirable as a candidate or you have to relocate or whatever it is um you know you are going to have to pitch it a little bit so make sure that you're prepared um practice it as much as you can and don't be afraid to ask for it because i promise you other people are asking for it too and they'll get the yes instead of you so what is one thing that you wish you knew graduating from Rutgers and then starting your job? So, you know, what is, is it? Is it something that you wish that you did? Or I'll give you guys a moment to think about that because I'm trying to think about that myself. Like, what is something that I wish that someone told me in the first year of working? Um, I think maybe, I mean, actually, now that I'm speaking, <laughs> Maybe this will spark something for you, but I think it was Brandy that said this, but uh, maybe Brandy or Molly, one of you was talking about, 
you know, don't be afraid to speak up about, about internal roles or, you know, if, if you weren't comfortable talking with your manager, like I had a buddy in my first job, but I also had multiple managers, like my project manager, the department manager, the team manager. And it, to me, that was almost very overwhelming. Like I didn't know who to have which conversation with. So I looked, I t- had conversations externally and I, I feel like I had mentors, but I think it, if someone had just pulled me back and said, what are, you know, what are, what is your main goal and how can I best support you? Then I would have been able to come up with like a game plan. <laughs> so maybe it just having someone say like, did you really think through what your, what your goal is right now? I, that that's something that I didn't really think through. So what's something that you didn't know, or um, what would have been helpful for someone to tell you? I wish I had spent more time developing like hard technical skills just because um, I joined a people science team where everyone else has like a master's or a PhD. And it's um, it's very challenging right now to sort of like upskill myself while also working full time. But I am really interested in being better at statistics and just data management and wrangling. And there's never an easier time to pick up those skills than when you're like at Rutgers and in school and can like dedicate like your time to learning those things and have like all of the resources and expertise like in the world to do those things. And it's not impossible to keep learning once you graduate, but I wish that I had spent more time just thinking about like, what are the in-demand technical skills in my field? And am I able to pick up some of those before I graduate? So I don't have to juggle navigating that and also learning what it means to be a full-time working professional. I think I wish that I had more practice having like sometimes uncomfortable conversations, like what it's like to sit through a performance review, even though, you know, you sometimes have that academically, it like somehow doesn't feel the same or like having to talk about money with your boss. Like those conversations are so new and challenging. And like, there's not always a YouTube tutorial about how to have them. Like, I wish that there was a little bit more training on just navigating those discussions in the workplace or like what to do if you and your manager are butting heads or you and an employee are having an issue and like just even how to bring it up and like how to say stuff like that. I know obviously we learn about it on, you know, managing it from an HR side and in the curriculum and everything, but just like some of those, like it's like adulting 101, you know, how to be in the workplace and, and how to have those conversations because I think you know, you're going to your friends for them or your family and it, it's just uncomfortable. Um, and I think that we sell ourselves short, we avoid them. Um, and then sometimes we find ourselves in, you know, situations we don't want to be. So if there was like training on, on things like that, real life situations you'll find yourself in, um, in the workplace, I, I wish I had more of that than learning the hard way. Um, I think for me, I wish I had the current knowledge I had right now um, in terms of knowing what I want out of a manager. I feel Mm -hmm. like early in my career, I was more so excited about the job and the opportunity and less of who I was going to learn from. So I may not have been able to gather all the information in the way I would like to because it was being delivered maybe in a way I didn't like. Um, And I sort of hindered myself by taking longer to, I feel, get to where I wanted or needed to be. So I wish I had forethought to understand what type of manager I needed to be successful and really grow in my career. That's great. Uh, Steven, there's a question for you in the chat from Gary. So he likes that you enjoy the culture at Goldman Sachs. You recently interviewed there for the talent acquisition department. Do you have any advice on how to stand out in the hiring process? Um, so I'd say if we want to get into like details, feel free to like reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can do that. But in terms of like general advice, I'd, um, it sounds so corny, but I'll be like, be your authentic self. And, um, but just really think about like, what's the like unique value that like only you bring to that position? Like what are the experiences and skill sets you have that like no one else has that same combination of like where you've lived, what you've learned and like what you've gone through professionally that like you are the best person positioned to take on that role. Great, that's awesome. Any other questions? Carlos, do you have any questions for them? 
Yeah, I can add a question in. So, you know, a conversation I have a lot with students is around imposter syndrome and sort of, you know, how do you navigate or how have you navigated sort of building up your confidence when you're going into your first role and, and believing in yourself and trusting that, you know, you were hired for a reason. They hired you because you have the talent and skills, right? And so, especially in the first role, I know it can be really intimidating. And so can you talk a little bit about maybe your experience, if you've gone through that or how you would advise people to build up that sense of confidence in themselves as professionals? Um, I can start. I have felt that way. I sometimes still feel that way. Um, and I actually like when I when I first started working, I would save every email that I got that had like even a morsel of a compliment in it um, to remind myself that like, oh, people here think I'm doing a good job. And I would put it all in a folder. And on a day that I was feeling really crappy, I would open it and read it. Um, sometimes I would just like open my resume again and read it and, and remind yourself that like Carlos said, they literally chose you for the job. They made an active decision to pick you amongst however many candidates or applicants there were. Um, and also, you know, take a step back and realize that everybody else is feeling the same way, likely, no matter how tenured they are in their career. Everybody feels insecure sometimes. Everybody feels like, what am I doing here? I don't even, what is my job? What am I supposed to be doing again? Why did they pick me? And just know that there's some relatability from everyone and you don't have to be at a hundred percent every single minute of every day, but do things that, you know, help pick you up. If it's making a folder like that, if it's, you know, talking to your manager, just getting a little pick me up, um, have those in your back pocket for when you need them. We have one more question. So this is from Isaiah, he's a senior. Yeah, he just says, great panel. When you graduated from undergrad and started your first role, uh, what rule of thumb did you have your, for yourself in, in regards to handling the pressure and the expectations that came from succeeding in your first role? Sometimes it's pressure we put on ourselves or we perceive from you know, our manager or our mentor. I think for myself, um, I actually went to grad school because I had so much anxiety about not getting a job after school um, or not knowing what to do or being successful. So I went to grad school, um, which bought me some time, but also helped me to realize exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, when you're passionate about something, it's easier to do it versus just not really enjoying what you like or what you want to do. So I would definitely suggest in order to ease that symptom or those scaries for you, um, find something that you really love doing and then apply it that way because when you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like you're working. It feels like you're just doing something you really enjoy. For me, um, I think it was actually Len Garrison that gave me this advice, love Len. Um, but we were just talking and he was like, Steven, you're 22, but I think this also applies if like you're 30 or even 40, like there are so many years that you will be working and having a career that when you think about it, like in the span of a 30 or 40 year career, the idea that you'll do your most impactful work, like in your first two years or when you're 22 or 23, like it's just most likely not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen because you're going to be learning that entire time. And getting better and like more adept. So it, that at least for me, like re relieved a lot of the pressure that like, this is just the beginning and like, I'm gonna keep growing and learning. And like, it's, this will never be the best thing I do in my career because I have like so many more ways to grow and learn. So like, why view it that way? I also like always set goals for myself and had like someone else at the company look at them to tell me if I was being crazy that I wanted to get promoted within six months or something, right? So I would like set them out and I would send them to my manager or like I had a counselor and things like that at the time to always sort of keep me on track and keep me on earth um, to make sure that I wasn't putting too much pressure on myself. So I think like always feel free to have somebody that's going to ground you a little bit, um, whether it's someone at your job or someone that's just familiar with your job or career path that can help you and say, that's actually more like a five-year goal, not a 90-day goal. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. We're going to end right on time. Uh, again, I did record this session for those of you that are just joining in. Um, 
I will be posting it online. I'm probably going to be cutting out part of this uh, where we were discussing, but just want to thank everyone again. Uh, you can refer to this for future reference. We'll be posting it on the Similar Career Services website. And it sounded like, I'm speaking for you, but that the panelists were willing to connect with individuals via LinkedIn based on uh, their enthusiasm. So feel free to jot their names down, remember, uh, and then you can reach out to anyone. We have Molly Leonard, Brandy Blunt, and Stephen Haverlock with us. And everyone is saying thank you. So thank you again for your time and I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. Thank you. <laughs>